Without further ado, I'm going to call up Dr. David Wall Rice. Let's give him a round of applause, please. And I want to remind you once again of the House rules. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good. I'm going to be real quick because I'm not doing the formal introduction, but I just wanted to say that I'm excited that uh, Professor Akbar is here to help us kick off a partnership that Morehouse has with Spelman College and with A3C, all three coasts. Um, it's it's our effort at Morehouse to be more intentional about how it is that we engage hip hop and hip hop culture and to do those things responsibly. And so one of the opportunities that we have to do that was to curate events at Morehouse. So Jeff Ogbar is doing uh, an event at Morehouse today, right now, uh, an event at Spelman College. Gene Gray is gonna be speaking in a master class uh, at Spelman for uh, Morehouse and Spelman College students at one o'clock today. And then tomorrow there's a full panel uh, at the Crown Plaza in Midtown that you all are able to go to for free. That's going to have everybody from Scarface to Master Ace to Combat Jack and a lot of other folks who are going to help to contextualize the importance of hip-hop music and hip-hop culture within these ideas of education and social justice movements. So I just wanted to tell you all about that to let you know that if you're interested in participating, you can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter uh, follow is at D Wall Rice, D W A L L R I C E. I just tweeted a full schedule of events that go from now through Saturday, and we hope that we will see you there. So, without further ado, to formally introduce our speaker for today, we have the uh, chair of the history department, uh, Professor Frederick Knight. Good morning. Um, I've known Dr. Okmar for over two decades now, both professionally and personally. And the last time we talked, he was training for a marathon. And I think that provides something of a metaphor for his level of intellectual stamina. He graduated from Morehouse College in 1991, and from there he entered into the PhD program at the University of, at Indiana University in Bloomington, where he studied with Richard Blackett. He graduated from there in 1997, receiving his PhD in U.S. history, and then from there took a position at the University of Connecticut, where he continued his dissertation research on the Black Power Movement. He moved through the ranks at the University of Connecticut, ultimately as establishing himself as director of the Institute of African American Studies, uh, holding an associate deanship position, and then became vice provost of diversity at the University of Connecticut. While he was there, he helped to attract a whole team of very talented African-American intellectuals to that community, including Jelani Cobb, who was a regular contributor to MSNBC. But more than being an administrator, he is a really top flight scholar. His book, Black Power, made at least two important contributions to our knowledge of the black uh, power movement. First, it, it really took black power seriously for the first time in terms of African-American historical literature. And in addition to that, he helped us understand the cross-fertilization between black power and other power movements, whether the Asian power movement or the Chicano power movements or the Puerto Rican uh, social justice movements in the 1960s and 1970s. In addition to that, he published a, brown, uh, a really groundbreaking work on hip hop titled Hip Hop Revolution, which did very fine-tuned analysis of hip hop lyrics. And in particular, he brings to the table uh, an analysis of these lyrics that give us a sense of hip-hop artists, not just as artists, but as intellectuals, people who are really grappling with some really difficult, challenging social problems that African Americans have faced with, particularly as it relates to the prison industrial complex. And so uh, as he is right here right now, in this phase of his intellectual marathon, I invite us to give him your full attention I present to you Dr. Jeffrey Oakbar. Uh, this is still morning. Good morning, brothers. How are you guys doing today? Good, good. Good seeing you out. It's a uh, distinct pleasure to be back here at Morehouse. I've had a chance to be back and speak to students over the years. And each time, uh, the homecoming is, is very, very sweet, is very, very appreciated. 
And it, it means a lot to come back to a school that means so much to you. Anyone who knows a Morehouse man knows that Morehouse men love their alma mater. And we love our alma mater with a sort of passion and a sort of visceral commitment that is uh, beyond sort of rhetorical. But we, we like to see the institution flourish. And we like to see the men of Morehouse uh, do well and uh, at the, the college itself. And, and part of the experience of being a man at Morehouse is attending things like, uh, like Crown Forum. And when I was here, it was part of the process of people who were from different majors, who would be exposed to different ways of thinking, uh, to, to hear speakers talk about the world around them. And some of my most memorable experiences of sort of learning about the world around me came from people who spoke, uh, and certainly in the classroom, with profound professors like Dr. Marcellus Barksdale here, who is a, he's been a mentor of mine for, for years, but also from, from people who stood at this pulpit who talked about things that I would not otherwise learn in the classroom. And I was fascinated by what I heard. We had people, Randall Robinson of Trans Africa, I remember Jawan Zikanjufu, sort of a, a black nationalist uh, economics guy from uh, Chicago. I remember a whole bunch of people talk about ancient Africa. And so much of this informed the way I saw the world. And so much of it was uh, how, I, how it complemented and in really important ways uh, augmented what I learned in the classroom and also learned among my friends just hanging out. And, uh, and we went to Shivers back in the day. I was actually too poor to live on campus, never lived on campus in my four years. But I would sneak into Shivers. And uh, so when I, when I snuck into Shivers and I had, and, and, and even there around the table, we would have uh, like wonderful conversations. And these conversations were really important to my, my intellectual maturation. And so I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to uh, stand here before you now. And, um, and, and thank the many people who helped make this happen. Uh, uh, Dr. David Rice, of course, is uh, really important. I, I, I'm excited to be part of this conference. Uh, Dr. Fred Knight, I've known him again, as he mentioned, for many years. And to see him uh, at the helm of the history department is a, is a huge honor. And, um, and just having this presentation, I'm, a, I'm, I'm kind of a, of a Luddite sort of crew when it comes to, to uh, technology. And I have, I'm probably stuck around 2003 with my technology, you know what I'm saying? So I'm, 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 I'm there, I'm not like all the way back in the 70s and everything, but, uh, but Mike, Mike Gary, who helped put this together and embed some of this in my presentation, is uh, very, very appreciated. All right, so, so anyth anybody who knows me and anyone who knows uh, you know, most professors, we love to pontificate. We love to talk a lot. And so I'm going to have to be, uh, I have my, my, my clock up here. I have to be over uh, by, by 11.50. Y'all don't want to hear me keep talking for a long time, so uh, mindful of your time. And, and hopefully this presentation will be one of those presentations that like when I was in your seat that I actually remembered it, it, and, and friends talked about it. So maybe in shivers, hopefully in the dorm rooms, and maybe in the classrooms, and maybe when you hang out with your girlfriends over Spelman or Clark or wherever, I hope that you guys get a chance to talk about uh, this, this, and this actually is something you carry with you. And that would, be, uh, that would mean a lot to me. Uh, as, as Dr. Knight said, my, my first book was on black power. My second book was on hip hop. And a few years ago, I got a chance to, to meld the two in a really kind of interesting presentation. And so this is building upon that presentation. It sort of brings together my understanding of the black power movement as well as social justice movements in general, and a conversation about hip hop itself and as hip hop emerged and developed. You guys are all pretty young. Uh, when I think about the, all the students here, and you guys probably only know of a certain historical moment when hip hop was dominated by social justice and resistive, when I say resistive, so resistive to white supremacy explicitly in its commercial form. So you could actually go to MTV or BET or turn on the radio and it's not like you have to find Immortal Technique on, uh, on YouTube. Like you have to go way far away and find someone like Immortal Technique, someone who does like conscious hip hop. But you actually had like militant conscious hip hop that was on the radio. And you had that's, this kind of stuff on videos. And it's really a, a different historical moment than what people experience now, where there has not been an adult male rapper who's gone platinum since the 1990s who hasn't called women B's and H's. And uh, we, we haven't had a space where commercial hip hop has been dominated by uh, sort of social justice impulses and critiques and subversive politics that uh, uh, extol black liberation and upliftment of the black community. Those things don't exist now in hip hop. So, so the, 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 this, this here is sort of looking at hip hop at, at its development and looking at the ways in which hip hop emerged but followed what social movement theorists argue this different stages of social movements. So social movements have a sort of emergence, a coalition, a sort of rise, 
and then a decline, right? And so we can look at the Black Panther Party, the Black Power Movement. We can look at the Black Power Movement and look at the forces that gave rise to the Black Power Movement and the sort of organic development of resistive politics. And then we look at the ways in which those sort of organic efforts coalesce around or organizations like the uh, uh, Republic of New Africa, the uh, Black Panther Party, or a whole bunch of other organizations that call themselves the Black Panther Party in different parts of the country, and then, or the US organization. So we look at these organizations, then we look at a sort of uh, a, a, a point when this movement reaches a crescendo of sorts, but then we have a decline. And the decline could be a consequence of different factors. It could be the success of the movement. So if the movement is in fact arguing for uh, you know, a number of goals, and the goals might be black access to, to jobs or housing or uh, voting or these sorts of things. As those things get um, are, are achieved, then the movement itself recedes, right? If, if the movement is to the end the war in Vietnam, and as the war in Vietnam ends, of course, the movement would decline. Or it could be repression. And not that the movement was successful, it's just that the state that sought to repress the movement was particularly successful in uh, undermining and destroying that movement. So we have a sort of that. Or we also have a third thing, uh, co-option, um, co where the movement itself might start off with a particular goal, a particular set. It might be a very radical agenda. And I learned this in Dr. Barksdale's class when we talk about revolution, uh, defining revolution as fundamental systemic change. Remember that, right? I always remember it. And so, so we think of fundamental systemic change, not just a sort of reformist approach. So you have reformist organizations that say, we see this system that might be problematic and oppressive, but we want, uh, and, and we have this super system here, black folks are here not allowed to be in this system. We would like black people to be anywhere in the United States military, anywhere in government, anywhere in the school system. We would like black folks to be disseminated and dispersed throughout in relation to our proportion of society. So the system itself stays intact, it's just that the system is now diverse. And so there are other people who are saying, we don't want to just be distributed throughout the system. We think the system itself is fundamentally corrupt and needs to be fundamentally overhauled, and that's a revolution, right? So we have reformists and revolu revolutionary politics. So part of the co-option element could be that what may appear as revolutionary at first, so the instance of imagining black power coming out. In 1966, the beginning of what we call the black power movement, the, the proponents of black power insisted that black power was not anti-white, but the empowerment of a politically, economically, socially marginalized black community. And they also were very clear in celebrating the humanity of black people and the beauty of black people and the intelligence of black people in the ways the civil rights movement never did. They talked about Afros, they talked about names, they talked about history, they had all these other things, as well as self-defense. So they had all this stuff in there. And at the time, the people who were hostile to black power, including people, I'm not pointing to y'all, like <laughs> you guys are all those people, but even people in the black community, the NAACP's leader, uh, Roy Wilkins, said that black power was a reverse Ku Klux Klan, a reverse Hitler, the mother of violence, and father of hatred, right? So he actually compared black power, he's a black man, compared black power to the greatest mass murderer known, uh, certainly the most popular mass murderer known uh, in the 20th century. And so, so we, we think about the vitriol attacked at black power from all sorts of corners. Would you believe by 1969, uh, a sort of conservative icon and president of the United States, Richard Nixon, in fact, argued that he was for black power. Uh, we even have um, people like uh, Whitney Young, the head of the National Urban League, a very moderate organization that was virulently anti-black power. Whitney Young said he supported black power. So, so in this process, we can see that co-option element. So what we're going to do today is look at, as a sort of overview, and then by, the, by 1975, the black power movement, is, there's a denouement and a decline in sort of disarray of the black power movement. What we're going to do today is look at hip hop. And we're going to look at hip hop's move towards social justice issues, but what were the circumstances that gave rise to this sort of impulse in hip hop? And then we're going to look at the rise of it, the coalition, the institutionalization, and then we we'll look at the decline. And you guys, we had a chance to look at co-option, perhaps repression, or perhaps success. Or maybe it's a mix of all those things. And some of these things are, are left for debate. I don't have the answers for all these things, but we'll, we'll get a chance to look at some of that. And the last thing I'll say is our introduction is we also, I'll, I'll introduce a term called uh, controlling images. Controlling images is a, is a term, a concept created by Patricia Hill Collins 
a, um, in her book, uh, Radical Black Feminism, and she talks about the ways in which there are certain images promulgated around black women, these controlling images, these sort of hostile archetypes of black women. And I'm going to use these controlling images to apply to black people broadly and how we understand minstrelsy or certain hostile archetypes that have been applied to African Americans, uh, and this will help frame how we understand some of this. All right, so I'm going to try to do my clicker from way across the room. Wow, that's amazing. It works. All right, so I'm going to start with, uh, with th this is actually, I, 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 this is not high-level art, as you guys can see here. This is your boy uh, Tyrese Gibson decided to, he said he woke up one day after having a dream and was inspired to paint this. And Tyrese Gibson, of course, the R&B singer and actor. And when he did this, it, this is just something that he came up with. And it's a really kind of interesting uh, take on the, this bridge of what we kind of, we were talking about here about hip hop and, and black power, social movements, and that kind of thing. And Tupac himself is, um, to many ways, a personification of that bridge connecting two different generations, two different impulses around social justice and resistance and militancy, consciousness. There's so much to be said there, and so much that even can be said about deconstructing this image. But I, I thought it would be an interesting starting point when you kind of think about uh, you know, uh, hip hop itself. And I only met Tupac, I, I met a number of, I, was, I call myself like the Forrest Gump of, uh, of like scholarship, right? Like with Forrest Gump, y'all ever saw a movie, he happens to meet all these people in history, these important folks, and at the right place at the right time. And I happened to meet a whole bunch of random people over the years writing this book. Not because I, I had any clout or anything writing Hip Hop Revolution, but being at the right place at the right time. But the first rapper, uh, the first, uh, the only, and one and only time I met Tupac was actually here at Morehouse. Y'all don't know this probably, but this is part of Morehouse's history with Dr. Barstow writing the history of Morehouse in 1990 we had a um, commemoration for the, it was the 25th anniversary of Malcolm X's assassination in February 1990. I was a junior uh, in college. I was a little, a little radical student, as Dr. Barksdale uh, might recall, and this is when I got my African name, and uh, one of our fellow history majors, Fanon Wilkins, uh, put together an event, and I was president of the History Majors Club, and I was supposed to speak at this event. So it was right here on campus, and we brought different organizations from the community to give a talk about Malcolm X, his importance. At the time, uh, the movie Malcolm X had not come out yet uh, by our brother Spike Lee, but there were Malcolm X t-shirts, and uh, people had X hats, and all these different things were starting to emerge, and Malcolm was a very important figure. He was sampled in hip-hop all over the place, and uh, it was a big deal to have this, uh, this celebration, really, of his life, not of, of his assassination. His birth date is uh, May 19, the semester, the school will be over, so we had this thing uh, on that. And we had different student organizations come out, as well as people from the community, and uh, there was a group called the New African Panthers, and there was a young man who was... Um, who was the head of the New African Panthers, of course it was Tupac, and he spoke at this event. And what he did was announce, he was only two years younger than me, and he did this rhyme, and he, he spit this rhyme and told everyone that there was an album coming out the next year to look for it. Actually came out two years later, but his album uh, was uh, important. When he first came out, he harkens back in no uncertain terms to the Black Power Movement. And when he spit, the, when he spat that rhyme that day uh, here on campus, he also harkened back to that movement. And in the 1990, when he did this hip hop rhyme at Morehouse College, this was a historical moment when hip hop itself was um, inextricably connected to the larger social political forces going on throughout the United States and black communities. And we were sensitive to uh, what we what became known as endangered black male, sort of a endangered species, this term that social scientists coined around 1988 to talk about the declining conditions in the black community and how particularly virulent they were when it came to black men. We talked about increasing homicide rates and, and incarceration rates and children born out of wedlock. And so people had all these dystopian, these ideas about how black, where black people would be by the year 2000. They would say, how many people would be dead? How many people would be in jail? And it was a sort of very, it was a sense of alarm that people People, uh, had. And as this went on, well, also the rise of crack cocaine trade, uh, this sense of urgency was manifested with an increasing level of political consciousness in black communities, and hip hop was uh, front and center with a lot of that discourse. And this young Tupac uh, connected that. So here on campus, 1990, celebration around Malcolm X, and actually Tupac uh, spoke at that, uh, that event, the one and only time I ever, I ever met him. Uh, so when you think about hip hop formation, I'm, I'm going to just brush through this very quickly. South Bronx, uh, in the early 1970s, of the five boroughs of New York City, the Bronx is the poorest borough. The poorest section of the poorest borough was the South Bronx. And when people talk about things being a war zone, we've always heard this, oh, this is a war zone, that was a war zone. 
Literally, when we think about, about uh, the South Bronx, it looked like a war zone, not a figurative way, but a literal way. There, there was a high rate of, uh, of disease, of infrastructure um, uh, destruction, of uh, violence, and we have a number of gangs. And, uh, and among those gangs, uh, we have, in 1973, a, a truce emerges, a Long and short of it, there's an organization that's, that's formed called the, it's actually called the organization initially, then called the Zulu Nation, then the Mighty Zulu Nation, then the Universal Zulu Nation. It goes to different names. But what's interesting here is that the most feared elements of society, young black and Latino males, young black and Latino males, in perhaps the most feared community in the United States of America, in the urban space. There are movies about uh, the Bronx, Escape from uh, Fort Apache, uh, you know, the Warriors, you know, all these things about gangs in New York City, and people saw this as perhaps the most uh, violent place in the, in, uh, in the United States. And there, with a community of people perhaps most feared, we have the genius of hip-hop, the creative genius of hip-hop emerges. The four elements uh, come together. The DJ, uh, uh, B-boys or B-girls, uh, the MC, and ultimately graffiti art. Uh, and th these are pictures right here. We talk about look looking like a, like a war zone. This is the Bronx, 1970s. If you take pictures, juxtapose these with uh, pictures of Germany after World War II, uh, 1945, they look similar. Uh, bombed out buildings, uh, uh, again, a very dystopian space. Uh, this is what uh, gave world to, uh, to hip hop at this time. These are some of the gangs that came out. And when hip hop comes out, and we kind of look at, uh, at the four stages of social movements, emergence, coalescence, bureaucratization, decline, and then we look at success, organizational failure, co-option, repression, and these sorts of things. All right, so we think about first thing, let's look at our social movement goals, addressing a range of social ills in the black community. And when I sat here with those you know, same seats, and it looks like the seats haven't been changed since uh, 88. I know I sat on one of them, it was sinking real low. So, but hey, I'm still excited to be back. No, 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 no hate, no shade. So right here we have uh, homicide rates. This is what we talked about at that time. People sat, sat at this podium talked about these increasing homicide rates, the drug trade, uh, health care, prison industrial complex, police brutality. All right, Black Power is a template. These are some of the organizations, historical consciousness, tricolors, a green, black, and red flag coming out of black nationalism, mass action. Let's look at emergence. All right, little or no organization. When hip-hop emerges, there's little or no organization. All right, early years of hip-hop, young people in the Bronx come together, parties in the park. Uh, we have widespread discontent. All the things I talked about in the South Bronx going on. You, you can't find a more dystopian space in an urban center than the South Bronx in the United States, right? It's like you couldn't find a more hellish place for black people to live than the Mississippi Delta. And what does the Mississippi Delta give you? They give you the blues, right? And the blues becomes this form of music that speaks to that sort of condition, and people all around the world become aware of it from those, that particular historical social moment. And in the Bronx at that time, this is what the world uh, uh, sees come out of it. But it's not actually a celebration of the horrors of the South Bronx. It's not a celebration of being tough coming out of the South Bronx and how many people you can set, kill or how much heroin you can deal. A crack had not come out yet. Heroin, two-thirds of heroin consumption happened in the New York metro area, but they weren't talking about the joys of selling heroin. Uh, they actually had a sort of escapist, and it wasn't particularly political either, but it was sort of a escapist about uh, how, much, how much grandeur you had, how much wealth you had, and it was a very fanciful, uh, fictive narrative that was often uh, created out of that space. All right, uh, but by the late 1980s, things start to change. One of the first hip-hop songs that has a, has, has a political message is, or commentary of some sort is The Message. It's actually written not by uh, Melly Mel or uh, Grandmaster Flash or the rappers here. It was actually written by someone else who gave it to the group, and the group reluctantly decided to do a song about it. Uh, we think about coalescence, and this becomes important for us now. All right, we think about coalescence, and by the mid-1980s, we have the rise of all these sorts of, and data, reams of data will come out about how terrible circumstances are in the black community. And around this time, we have people who are beginning to critique the, uh, the social and political space of hip hop and um, the world of black folks at this time. And this term in 1988 is coined um, endangered species, a black male is endangered species. And then people start to talk about genocide. And people say, well, there seems to be some systematic effort at eliminating uh, black people. And there seems to be uh, a hand in the black community towards this uh, elimination of black folks. And that, of course, would be this critique of black, what became known as black on black violence. But let me give you some numbers here, just to provide some context for this sense of alarm. All right, I hope I haven't lost you guys yet. So it's, this is the part where the numbers aren't going to appear here, but I'm going to give them to you and give you an idea of when people talk about genocide, it might seem a little hyperbolic, right? A little extreme. Like, what do they mean by genocide, right? It seems a little, little, little wild. So, so this, there's a, a scholar decides to look at 
the homis the death the annual death rate of black folks. So so and then looking at black men in particular. And as people talk about endangered black male species, there there's a way you could say if black men had the life expectancy of white men in 1991, how many excess deaths can we explain? So if, if black men died at the same rate that white men did every year, how many black men would be saved each year? All right? So we find in 1991, this is a year I graduated, and that year at the sort of apogee, we might say, of, of conscious hip hop, there were 95,064 black men who died. Right? 95,000, not all of them got killed from violence or anything, but 95,000 died. So it was like heart disease, all kinds of different things, right? So 95,000. Uh, if they died at the same rate of white men, it would have been 49,000. So this means we have an excess of 45,000 black men in that one year, an excess level of death. And so when people talked about this, people were saying, we're dying at such extreme rates. But when we think about genocide, can we just assume genocide is always, and this is, this, genocide is not defined by what we think of with Jews and the Holocaust, where people are rounded up, gassed to death, or murdered in systematic, explicit ways like that. There are ways that one can cordon off entire populations and then uh, through man-made factors foment famine, for example, and then people can die at these rates. And these systematic efforts to marginalize or, or kill portions or large parts of a population can be defined as genocide, right? So there are conditions that can, can be made to precipitate violence or death, and those can be also understood as genocide. So this is a sort of framework around which people operated. Now let's look at white men at that year, the same year. There were 4, 410,000 white men who died that year. Of course, about seven times the population of black people. Uh, if, if white men, now check this out, if white men died the same rate that black men did at that time, then you would have nearly 800,000 white men killed, which is an excess. Now, just the excess number is important here. So imagine if white men had an extra 376,000 deaths in a year. So if white men, if the white community was besieged with the same level of death in their communities, then in excess, 376,000 white men were dying annually. Would there be a sense of alarm? Would there be a sense of urgency? Would there be a response? Would there be a systematic response from the federal, state, local governments to deal with this issue of over 300,000 white men dying uh, 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 each year in excess? So, so the sources of those deaths uh, were sources of concern for the black community and systematically in different areas of society, academics, grassroots activists, uh, and hip-hop artists were all tied to this movement and hip-hop started to uh, take notice and talk about this. And what we have here is, this is song, this is self-destruction. This is by, and, uh, and Mike, maybe you could make that happen there. This is uh, a response. This is really cool. This is uh, around 19, this is 19, I crossed 89, so 1989. And this is 1989. We all agree tonight, all of the speakers have agreed that America has a very serious problem. Not only does America have a very serious problem, but our people have a very serious problem. America's problem is It really ain't the rap audience that's bugging It's one or two suckers, ignorant brothers Trying to rob and steal from one another You get caught in the mid So to crush that stereotype, here's what we did We got ourselves together So that you could unite and fight for what's right Not negative cause The way we live is positive We don't kill our relatives Pop, pop Alright, so what we have there with that song is a really important collection of rappers in the New York area who come together with this Stop the Violence movement. And keep in mind, they define themselves as a movement. At this time, Karis won, and a lot of rappers adopt names. And this is kind of interesting here. I want you guys, uh, and I guess this is before many of you guys have even born. But the names that they even have, Karis won, many of you guys have heard this, is knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everybody, right? Or knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone, depending on what song you refer to. And we also have people like uh, the Poor Righteous Teachers. We have um, uh, Professor X, the Overseer. We have Wise Intelligent. We have these names, in fact, that, that celebrate uh, ingenuity, that celebrate uh, intelligence, and all these different things, and even a sort of re resistive space that in many ways is an like anti-minstrel. 
And they talk about the menstrual, they talk about these controlling images. And Karis, one of the other songs, will talk about, I'm not like, talks about not being one of these coons eating chicken and watermelon uh, uh, on a corner, uh, talk broken English and drug selling, despite you said talk broken English, and said speak broken English. And so we have, we have this sort of critique there in hip hop at this moment. But also, there's a style that comes out with hip hop and, and the, uh, with Run DMC and other rappers. And this style is very different from we have with, uh, with, with R&B, it's very different from jazz, it's very, although with bebop, there's some overlap. And, uh, and very different from we find with, uh, with gospel or a lot of other forms of uh, black musical expression, rock and roll. And one of the things is um, not, not only me mugging, but there's a sort of cool that comes along with, uh, with hip hop as well. And that cool, resistive, subversive space becomes really important. But we think about the uh, quickly, the, the way in which hip hop became sort of your racket to top. I can't even say that word, it's a struggle there for me. You see it right there. Uh, also called the formalization stage. So we think about the formalization stage of hip hop in the uh, 1980s, real fast, a few things happened in 88 and 89. Uh, UMCV Raps comes out. UMCV Raps is the first rap show to have all videos on, uh, on cable. MCV initially did not even have black people on their shows. They had, uh, when they debuted, they had four VJs, one of whom was black, but they didn't play black artists. And under criticism, they played Herbie Hancock and then eventually Michael Jackson and the rest is history. But rap, they were reluctant and eventually they played rap with uh, UMCV raps, became a, a huge hit. A year later, MT, uh, BET came out with um, uh, Rap City and Rap City became a, a huge hit as well. And we have in 1989, The Source magazine is created. And finally, the Grammys decided to acknowledge rap as a real category in this award show. So this is a process of the formalization. We also have uh, platinum groups for the first time. Uh, LL uh, Cool J and uh, people signed to Def Jam, BC Boys, they eventually go platinum. Uh, Run DMC is the first group to go platinum, first group to have an LP. So we have that process of hip hop becoming formalized uh, in this stage. So we have a high levels of organization, coalition-based strategies, where print media, visual media, mainstream music, all these things happen. Radio stations decide to play uh, the music. And this, of course, early, um, early source. The source actually is important. If I want to go back real fast. When the source came out in 1989, it came out in a period of heightened political consciousness. And the, the people who found the source were actually two white students at Harvard. And the two white guys at Harvard decided that they were going to take a principal stance about who they put in the cover and the kind of ads they have. They decided to have no alcohol ads in the source. Despite what, you know, we kind of think of how alcohol has been in hip hop in all sorts of ways. They said no alcohol ads, no tobacco ads in the source. And they decided to put people on the cover who weren't always rappers. They put Malcolm X on the cover of the source, despite the fact that Malcolm X uh, was not a rapper. And Vanilla Ice outsold almost everyone in hip hop except for uh, MC Hammer, but he never appeared on the cover of the source, right? And so they, and so they, they had certain uh, stances where they didn't even have uh, the BC Boys, although BC Boys were, were in many ways celebrated. They did not appear on the cover of the source. Source, uh, a white group, although Mike Tyson appeared on the cover of the source. All right, so, so the source actually has some political stance, and they covered a lot of things. They talk about mass incarceration, they talk about blood diamonds, they talk about uh, wars in Africa, and other things. Uh, when we think about the ways in which hip hop starts to become uh, institutionalized and more radical, we have uh, no group is as more iconic than Public Enemy. And Public Enemy will come out, this is their, their second album, 1988, that same period we're talking about here, this sort of reaching this, this, uh, this, this high point in this, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. And this album, they're actually behind bars, and their symbol would be a b-boy in the crosshairs of Assassin's uh, Scope. And what's important there is that the b-boy, in no uncertain terms, we think about this sort of, this idea of endangered black male species, of excess death, we think about violence, we think about all these things, the ways in which black men are targeted, and young black Latino males targeted, the creators of hip hop, but also the idea they might in fact be a public enemy. So there was no sort of uncertainty about public, public enemy stands, where they were, and where they're behind bars here. And they have a really fascinating song, you guys should check it out, called Black Steel in the Hour of Chaos where they are, well, Chuck D is incarcerated for refusing to fight in the United States war, serving the military. And uh, unlike a lot of hip hop songs where people go to jail and they just kind of rapping and stuff and just hanging out in jail, they actually are liberated by the S1Ws, which are clearly influenced by the Black Panther Party, the Black Berets and so on. And the S1Ws liberate them from uh, this, this, this uh, prison, Chuck D from prison. The album right here, you can't tell from this shot, but in a larger shot, they're standing on an American flag. So, so there's even a, a, a very subversive take on the United States government in this. And they have a lot of lines that talk about and harken back to the Black Power Movement. And this one line comes off of um, uh, one of their songs. 
They say uh, this party started right in 66 with a pro-black radical mix. Then at the hour of 12, some force cut off the power and emerged from hell. But when they say this party started right in 66, of course, they're referring to the Black Panther Party. Chuck D's parents were involved in the Black Panther Party. Um, the party started right in 66, the year the Black Panther Party started. There's also the year the Black Power Movement uh, formed. So there's a sort of didactic element there where hip hop was informing the people in a sort of organic intellectualism that was uh, profound and pervasive. At the same time, black students across the United States were in involved increasingly in activism. So when we think about the Black Power Movement, the Black Power Movement must be understood as a movement that was pervasive. It was ubiquitous in the black society. It fundamentally changed after Americans uh, through different regions, classes, and all kinds of different ways. But in every space, whether we're talking about professionals like firefighters or social workers, they created new organizations, Association of Black Firefighters, Association of Black Social Workers, but also students, prisoners, all sorts of people were involved in this movement. So by, when we get to the late 1980s and early 1990s, the same thing occurs uh, here. We have a number of student organizations, student papers, and so on. Howard University had a national protest. Uh, Morehouse College, we actually took over administration right here, and President Leroy Keith got up here and the whole administration and tried to, I was one of 12 students that had this uprising. And out of that, one of our demands was an uh, African American Studies program. And so they, you owe me, uh, Dr. Barstow. All right, and uh, so uh, Hampton University, University of Amherst, UCLA, and Georgia State uh, all had protests around this time. The African American Studies program at Georgia State is a consequence to uh, its protests in 1992. And then we have, of course, decline. And then, this is when we talk about co-option, repressed success and failure. So let's look at this real fast as we wind down. Uh, we think about Fight the Power, Public Enemies video. Um, it is unmistakably tied to uh, the idea of movements. And there are a whole bunch of other videos here. But we talk about co-option. Although we can't show these videos here, many videos would take the iconography of early militant styles of hip hop and embrace those, but shift the focus from black liberation or resistance to the state uh, for black liberation to resist it from the state for criminal enterprise that might be at the detriment of black people. For example, public enemy Chuck D says, the police are tapping my phone, they won't leave me alone. I'm even lethal when I'm unarmed because I'm louder than a bomb. And he's talking about the police are tapping his phone because he's, of course, a, a radical militant. Biggie later will talk about the police, the feds are tapping his phone, not because he's trying to free black people because he's a radical, because he, of course, is selling crack. He's a gangster. He's a thug. And so the subversive element is twisted, and it becomes a sort of force, uh, not for black liberation, but often to the black, for black demise. And then, of course, you can have someone like Malcolm X right here on the left. His image can be co-opted by someone saying, trap or die, right? I want to sell crack or die. And I'm going to take Malcolm's image right here and do so. A wild bastardization of much of this. And then we have other folks that aren't necessarily, we have uh, Casual right here on the left, we have uh, Yasin Bey on the right, and they've taken uh, Malcolm X's stuff, and they, of course, when we talk about co-option, in this case, they see themselves as ideological heirs, as artists of Malcolm X. We go back to 1988, this is uh, KRS-One. This image has been taken by so many rappers. Uh, Malcolm X with assault rifle peering out the window in 1964. And this is um, KRS-One signifying that. The cover of my book, uh, Hip Hop Revolution, actually does this with a different uh, with a DJ using a turntable as his, as his weapon of choice. Uh, we have co-option here with Shine. Uh, Shine, of course, famously went to jail for shooting a black woman in the face, hanging out with your boy uh, Diddy in a club in 1999. And um, again, not for freeing black people with Shine put in jail, but uh, uh, for shooting a black woman in the face. Uh, here we have uh, Nicki Minaj. This is your girl. This year, your girl Nicki Minaj comes out with my, my, my lady tells me not to use the N word. I was saying that earlier today. So, but looking ass ninja, right? And so, 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 so with this, she actually takes Malcolm X, again, perhaps no more visible a militant icon of black liberation and uses his famous posture to actually talk about her desire to kill looking ass ninjas. And so it's fascinating. You see the video, she has guns, she's shooting in the air, and she's talking about how much contempt she has for looking ass ninjas. And then she, we go to Chirac. And again, to talk about the co-option and the bastardization of hip hop iconography, black power iconography, and the decline and co-option, here we have Chirac from uh, Nicki Minaj, where she says, these ninjas I roll with, don't let a single thing get by them. Talking about killing folks. And this is at a point when black people are dying in droves in Chicago. To the point that people are saying Chicago is worse than Iraq, hence the name Chirac, as many of you know. But she says, but then she makes reference to the fact that people got mad they choose Malcolm X. And she says, what did she say? Kingpins and them drug lords, shy town, no gun laws, broke bees that talk stuff. Sorry, I didn't get that out. Uh, now them bees I stunt for. Malcolm X's daughter came at me. 
looking ass ninjas ain't happy. Which is absolutely fascinating. When I was your age at this time, we could not satirize. This would have been a bad skit on a living color to imagine like 20 years from now where hip hop would be uh, when we think about the bastardization of hip hop, that you could take someone like Malcolm X and use him as an instrument to celebrate black death and then call his daughter a, a looking, looking ass ninja. All right. Uh, here we have, uh, uh, again, I'm not going to get into great detail here. We're running out of time. When we look at the numbers right here, we talk about Chirac. This is uh, the death toll here is, in fact, uh, the deaths in, in here are, are higher than they have been in Iraq for many years, uh, right, or comparable. And you got to keep in mind that you're looking at uh, mostly black males being killed here. But one will actually show through analysis that if you look at black men between the ages of 15 and 30, sort of military age, black men in Chicago, the rates are significantly higher than U.S. military uh, troops in war zones. And this is the level of death that, of course, has been celebrated, even co-opting uh, uh, black power iconography. I'm not going to say all elements of black power iconography are sort of anti-black in the way that Nicki Minaj might have it. We have these sorts of things right here. We also have elements of repression that we are running out of time, but lawsuits, radio, uh, hip-hop police, all these are forces that repress that we know with uh, hip-hop radicalism. And then we also have successes. At the same time, there's been a, a, a mainstreaming of hip-hop and access to millions of dollars and the creation of people who are worth half a billion in the case of Jay-Z and others. Uh, we have access to the, and, and penetration to the commercial uh, uh, forces in ways that people never imagined. This is your boy Diddy right here. And again, uh, iconography from the Black Power Movement. And these successes and so on might uh, lead one to believe that radical impulses are no longer needed in a society. Uh, in conclusion, I'll just say that hip hop itself is always uh, tied, like any culture, to the people that gives rise to it, that, uh, that you yourselves are architects of much of this. And we think even in your, 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 your lifetimes, you've seen hip hop artists and what I call hip hop millennials be uh, deeply involved in all sorts of activism. So I'm not going to say that activism is not part of it, although commercial hip hop doesn't reflect it. But when we think about mass incarceration, we think about how people responded in 2005 to Hurricane Katrina or the Gen of Six, Trayvon Martin or Mike Brown, uh, all the way to the election of Obama in 08. In fact, that young African Americans outvoted every demographic of young people in the United States in 2008. And the turnout, the possibilities for your generation are quite vast, and they must uh, not be denied or underutilized, whether they're in the forms of hip hop or night. Uh, I'm out of time. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Hope you guys have a good day. Let's give him one more round of applause. And brothers, don't leave. We're going to sing the college hymn. So please stand, lock up, respect the hymn, gentlemen. Everybody!